Okay. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody to this um, to this session. We're we're hoping you enjoyed the first one. My name is Shelley Halling. I will be moderating this session today, and um, this session will go from 11 to 11:35. We'll give a little notice to Vonda at about 11:20, 11:22, and that'll give allow her some time for Q and A. If you would like to, of course, join in. If you want to post your questions in the chat, I will I'll monitor those and, and take notes of those, and we can include those in the Q and A as we as we go along. But let me introduce Dr. Um, Vonda Vonda Jump Norman. Um, she is an associate professor in social work at the Brigham Assistant. City campus. Assistant. I'm sorry, what did I say wrong? You said assistant. assistant professor. Oh, assistant. I promoted you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> power. Glad that's already done. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me start again. Dr. Vonda Jump Norman is an assistant professor in social work at the Brigham City campus at Utah State University and is director of the Trauma Resiliency Project at the Family Place in Logan. Her research focuses on promoting positive parent-child relationships and the optimal development of children, of children impacted by adversity. She serves as co-chair on the Resilience Through Caring Connections Collaborative and the goal of preventing, with the goal of preventing trauma, educating others about the impact of trauma, and working to actively support healing after trauma. She is a steering committee member of the Utah Co um, Coalition for Protecting Childhood, and I'm, I'm in looking forward to this. So I'll turn the time to you, um, Vonda, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Shelley. Well, as you can see, I, I do a lot of work around trying to promote positive outcomes as much as possible. And I'm beginning my fifth year as a faculty member here in social work. I was a researcher for 20 years at the university beforehand, working to optimize outcomes for at-risk children and families. And as we move through the presentation, I, you know, one thing that I really want us to think about is the power of relationships in promoting positive outcomes. Something so simple, and yet it's so incredibly valuable. In fact, it's the number one predictor of resilience for kids, university students, all of us who have experienced adverse experiences or trauma in our lives. And it's so amazing to think that something so simple is so powerful. So if there's nothing else that you take from my presentation today, it's the power of developing relationships with our students. And today I'm gonna to be talking just a little bit about the prevalence of trauma in our society overall, and then the impact of trauma on our students, or the potential impact, because we don't want to be deterministic. There are many students that we interface with who have had lots of traumatic events, and they are functioning exceedingly well at the university. And then there are students who have experienced very few traumatic events and they're having a really hard time. And lots of times that comes back to our connection. So none of it is deterministic, um, but these are potential impacts. I'll be talking about some of the classroom practices that we can implement so we can support students and things for us as a university to think about. Some of these things we're already doing and some of them we can continue to incorporate in our practices as a university overall. So I don't know if you guys have heard about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This study was published back in 1998 and it was done at Kaiser Permanente with over 17,000 middle-class adults. What they were doing was they, well I should say middle-class, college ed educated, mostly white adults and Vince Felitti here at the top and Robert Anda on the bottom, they wanted to better understand the impact of trauma in childhood on adult outcomes based on what they had seen in their own practices. And there were, they looked at 10 different traumatic experiences. Um, abuse, and that includes physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Neglect, including physical and emotional. And then household dysfunction. And they were looking at domestic violence, divorce, mental illness, 
or depression and incarceration and substance use were their five areas of household dysfunction. What was shocking for them was to see the prevalence of trauma in our society overall. Two thirds of our country have experienced at least one traumatic event and 12 and a half percent or one in eight have experienced more than four or more adverse experiences. This, these studies published in 1998 have been replicated a number of times now and time and time again, the, the results are very similar. Sometimes we have more trauma, sometimes we have a little bit less, but usually it hovers around two thirds of the population have experienced traumatic events. And we are no different here in Utah with our results and the studies that have been done. So why does that matter? Um, well, it matters because as Dr. Villanueva talked about in her talk earlier so eloquently, we, we see a difference in the brain of students who have been impacted by trauma, particularly those students who have not have an, had an adult there to support their kind of management of those traumatic events. And what she talked about, she mentioned the learning brain and the survival brain. And the video that she showed, I think powerfully described what's happening in a student's brain when they are still actively pro processing trauma. And what we see is that the brain is compromised and, and that there are things that we can do to make a difference. We, we see um, this number of impacts, but for me, one of the more substantial when I think about students learning is the damage to the hippocampus, which is responsible for learning and memory. It basically shrinks when a person experiences ongoing trauma. And so often what happens is there's this thing called the neurons that fire together, wire together, so that a person can stay in that trauma brain for much of the time. So what we want to do is help maintain their safety. And we see all sorts of negative health impacts, heart disease, stroke, depression, COPD, cancer, autoimmune disorders, diabetes, all these have a dose dependent response to the trauma that a person has experienced in childhood. So that the more traumatic events a person has experienced, the more likely they are to experience these negative health health outcomes. And that extends beyond health to, um, to um, just lifetime accomplishment, ac academic achievement, um, success in school, and even the likelihood of finishing school. So why is this important? So likely then two thirds of our students coming to our classrooms have experienced ACEs one in eight of them have experienced four or more ACEs. And when I think of my classes in the social work department, if I have a class that has 32 students, then that means probably four of my students have experienced four or more ACEs. And then something to add to this is up to 50% of college students may experience additional traumas in their first year of college. And when we think about COVID-19 and students who've experienced traumatic events, for a person who has had trauma already, COVID-19 has probably increased their feeling of a lack of safety. That's one of the biggest needs that our students have is they don't feel, they often don't feel safe as a result of the trauma that they've experienced. And with the uncertainty that's been in our lives due to COVID-19, those trauma res responses could be exacerbated. 
there was a study that was done this summer and what they found was that 60% of students who were trying to access mental health care say that COVID-19 has made accessing care much more difficult and that they're having a harder time getting the help that they need. So let's just think about our students in our classroom. Some of the potential impacts that we might see are that our students could have difficulty focusing, attending classes, um, retaining the information that we're trying to get across to them, and in a stressful exam situation, recalling that information. Sometimes they have a tendency to miss our classes because they just can't get there. They have a fear of taking risk or a fear of failure. They might withdraw, become involved in unhealthy relationships. We might see anger, helplessness, or even dissociation when our students get stressed and anxiety. We see that. We see a lot of anxiety about deadlines, exams, um, how to work in groups, public speaking, all those sorts of things. I've had students who contact me to say, I'm so worried about this. And my task is to, first of all, just ease their anxiety and say, you know what? It's going to be hard. And, and I know that we're going to get through this together and provide confidence uh, help them support, you know, uh, effective techniques that I've found for being successful so that we can increase their sec success in the classroom. So if we just look in broad categories, there's a potential impact to their self-esteem, their behavior, emotion regulation, how do they deal with, with uh, these hard things that are there their ability to focus, plan, make good decisions. And sometimes we see these maladaptive coping skills in students with drinking or other substance use, withdrawing from class, and then becoming a bit confrontational with us. And our role when we have students who become confrontational is to first of all, just kind of calm everything back down and know that it's likely not you that they're really attacking or um, trying to anger. It's really their own challenges that they're trying to deal with. And our first job is to just calm them down and say, you know what? I can see you're really stressed about this. Let's think about how we can come to resolution. Um, and when we begin to co-regulate with them, it's really interesting because this is something that we, we know that we need to do with young kids. And the reality is particularly young adults and sometimes older adults who don't have very good emotion regulation skills, they need our support as well. And just us being calm and not being defensive can really help them to begin to calm down and to settle an issue. I had a student this summer who called me about something and she was she was pretty defensive and I could feel myself getting defensive because I felt like I was being attacked and I had to actually cognitively calm myself down and say you know what I can see you care about this and and I know that we can come to a good resolution let's think about it let me understand your situation a little bit better this is what I'm hearing right now is that what you're trying to tell me? And just, just being there to listen helped her calm down. And together we came to a great conclusion at the end of the conversation. And I think that she felt much better and I felt much better for sure. So as we think about how we help our students to resolve things, first of all, I want you to think about your most influential teachers. Why were they important to you? Why did they make a difference for you? For me, it was the relationship that I had with those teachers that was really important. Sometimes they were really funny. They just made me feel calm in class. Sometimes it was because I could see that they really cared. And, and sometimes it was just the knowledge that they were getting across 
that like I look back at some teachers and I think they had so much knowledge and I wish they would have been able to convey it more effectively because I wasn't really invested in that class sometimes. And sometimes it was because I felt like they were just up there wah, 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 talking and I wasn't really so important to them. And, you know, I went to the small private school for college. Like if I just think back to my university teachers, I, we had different professors who would have these like concerts for us. And for me, that just made, it made a connection because I saw them as humans. I had a, a professor who invited the whole class to his home for, for, like a like campfire and hanging out and a jam session if people were interested in music and those were really powerful experiences for me and i'm working to become a professor that my students will remember well and i'm finding that i fail all the time and I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing well and being compassionate with myself as I fail and making a commitment to always do better. So what are some things that we can actually do? The first of all is to be approachable, to let our students know we're here for you. And our goal is that you learn content and it's going to be a collaboration between you and me. I don't have all the answers. I'll go back when you ask me questions that I don't know. I'll get more information, but I want you to be able to ask the questions that you have. Um, I'm here to just help you in your own individual journey. And if I'm not meeting your needs for learning, I really want to know that because my goal is to get information across to you. And we also have to have very high expectations. We need to make, let our students know that we expect a lot of work in this class. It's gonna be a hard class and we know you can do it. We want to provide predictability, particularly for students who've experienced trauma because the more they feel control over their environment, the safer they feel. We need clear expectations. This is something that I'm not always so good at, particularly when the first time that I'm teaching a class, I learn afterward, oh, I was so unclear. But the more that we can look at our syllabi and our assignments and make sure they're clear, the better off our students will be. And we want to build relationships with our students. And as we can connect or ground our class in the real world, that can help students see the so what of our class. I do a lot of community-based learning with my students, which is easy in social work, of course, um, but it just really grounds the content that they're learning to the field that they're gonna be working in. And it's also a high impact teaching practice. When we have students who are missing class, maybe reaching out and just saying, hey, I'm just wondering if you're okay. I noticed you weren't here. And I did that for a student and she wrote back and she said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm glad to know that you care. And I've got, you know, a child with the flu, another one who is really having a hard time because of some other things that have happened. I didn't change my expectations for her, but she felt like she was cared about. And I think that that made her feel like she needed to be, performing at a higher level because she knew that I was paying attention. We want our students to feel safe. When we talk about our failures and how we've moved forward, we can help give students hope because they often just think that we've had an easy life and it's just a piece of cake. Whereas for many of us, I know that there have been lots of failures along the way and lots of learning opportunities. We want to be optimistic that our students can get it. When they tell us that we're struggling, say, do you know what? This happens every student or every year. It's hard material. I'm not surprised that you're having a hard time. And 
you're going to get it. You're going to be so surprised at the end of the semester how far you've come. Um, explaining the why we assign our assignments. I think that Dr. Villanueva talked about this really well in her talk when she talked about giving the purpose, the task, what are we supposed to be doing, and giving the rubric and examples. Um, that's a very trauma-informed um, practice. Group projects are a great way to help students connect to other students, as well as to have their own scaffolding be learned or be advanced as well. And one thing that I've learned is students don't always know how to work in groups. And so providing information to them about effective ways to work with each other, some ground rules can be helpful. We want to emph emphasize that, yep, this is going to be hard and you're going, the more we practice, the better you get. And the more we can, can see that even though these pieces were really hard, we're learning from those challenges. We can have these quick checks for understanding, thumbs up to the side or down, um, give choices and assignments. Um, I have a colleague who uses a layered grading format and that seems really effective. And I require my students to meet with me every semester. It's not an option to come to my, my office hours, they have to. And in my research methods class, they have to once a month. Then we can also respond to our email, to students' emails quickly, acknowledge students' strengths as well as their mistakes in the assignments. Let them know that we see all the great things that they're doing and there are these other pieces that they need to add in so that they, um, they get what, you know, what we're asking for. Remind students about their own self-care, taking care of themselves. Um, sometimes I practice mindfulness at the beginning of class and I'm not very funny. Um, sometimes I'm successful at using humor, other times not. Um, but it's a great tactic for those of you who are really funny. Some of the things that our university can do or is already doing, like the Connections program, is a wonderful resource for our first year students to be able to be involved in. And it helps them to feel connected early on. If you think about when you went to college, I don't know about you, but I was really anxious. I, I was lucky I got to go early because I participated in a sport. And so I got to know the university campus because of being there and I made connections with teammates. And so I was already feeling a little bit better by the time that classes started. And for so many of our students, they're just coming in and they don't have some of those connections. And so we want to facilitate that so that they feel like they belong from the very beginning. You know, a great thing that's happening at, at different universities across the country and internationally is to develop resilience or positive psychology programs that are university-wide. Um, the um, University of Toronto has a flourishing program. And what they found through their research is that students who are flourishing were twice as likely to graduate within five years than languishing students. And Florida State University requires all of their freshmen and transfer students to take several resilience workshops and watch videos. And then they can become more involved if they want to. The University of Test, I, I've provided a, a resource for you for the University of Texas at Austin because they have an amazing wealth of resources for us as faculty members as well as their students. So I encourage you to look at their website because you're going to be blown away. We can provide wellness opportunities, which we already do, right? Yoga, mindfulness, we can have gratitude, um, workshops, hikes. We really want to focus, focus on supporting our faculty well-being as well, because the better off our faculty members are doing, the better off or the better we'll be able to support our students. And I know that there's a session later this afternoon about faculty well-being. 
We can also provide mental health services, which we have excellent mental health services here at the university. And I know that we've been expanding those. In this time of COVID-19, I'm imagining that um, the more that we can be proactive in supporting students from the very beginning, the less likely we might be um, to need later mental health services. So if we can support our students at the very beginning with our positivity and our belief in them and that we're going to be there to scaffold their learning, the better off they will be. And I love this quote that we're not going to give up on our students. We're going to insist that they become the best that they can be, no matter what they have experienced in their lives. And um, we get so much. We learn more even through failure than through success. And so failure, when we have a student who is a fail failing right then, that's an opportunity to turn that into success for that student. So I'm really glad you guys came and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. I'm going to switch my computer here to being able to see some of you. So thank you, Vonda, so much. Um, so many great points um, that 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 you've brought out, and many of the, in the chat, many people I'm seeing how many people have been reaching out, especially during the the transition to to COVID learning in the spring, and and how they've reached out to students and 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 how how impactful that is. So we'll open open to for questions for a few minutes. Um, if you have some, if you'd like to put them in the chat, I'll, I'll monitor it that way. Or if you'd like to just speak out, that's great as well. Uh, hi, this is Mike. I, I have a quick question. Great, Mike. Is that okay, Vaughn? Vaughn, at the very beginning, you talked about those researchers that developed that scale in the 90s where they were talking about different trauma. I, I, I missed the na their names. What was, what was their names? Oh. Well, do you know what? If you look up adverse childhood experiences study, you're going to get so much. And their names are Vince Felitti, F-E-L-I-T-T-I, and Robert Anda, A-N-D-A. Because I, I think I've actually taken one of those one time just for curiosity. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> oh, no problem. It's, it's a powerful study. I have a question. Yes, we met. Thanks, Wanda, for, for this wonderful uh, presentation. I attended two years ago, I guess, uh, your present, or last year, I'm not sure. Two years ago, but, that's when we met. Yes, yes. Uh, my question is, so um, this is great to know your students, but at the same time, we are not clear of the traumas, right, as a professors, yeah. as, a, as a teachers. So along with that, uh, we need to be really careful every time we are teaching for those students and their expectations, their traumas, their, you know, everything is different, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and it's not just one student, but 30, 50, 60, whatever students. So, yes, 300 this, sometimes. Yes, this built another anxiety or more anxiety for professors. Uh, so, what do you suggest? What do you suggest? So, what is your suggestion, or how do you deal with it? Sure. So, first of all, we—you're right—we don't know our students' traumas, um, if they've experienced them or not, and we don't actually need to, because how we teach is the most important thing in in the learning environment for the students. And, you know, those things that I mentioned by, you know, having the high expectations, being clear about what we expect from students, providing these high impact learning experiences for students, um, being there when they reach out and they say, I'm having a hard time to say, I don't blame you. That sounds like a really hard thing that you're experiencing right now. Um, let's think of, let's break it down. Let's think about how to do this. I don't know if I'm answering your question, Mehmet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
along with this, along with this, you mentioned that your expectation from the students uh, should be clear, clear expectation, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, let me let me ask you this: um, clear expectation based on on what? So the the thing is. I sometimes put my expectation really vague uh, uh, from students because uh, so each student has different capacity, right? Like a single mom, like a disability, like a, so I don't want to push my one description or one expectation, like a privileged expectation for all. You know what I mean? So, so what do you think on that? So I think I'm not 100% sure that I understand your question. Um, like when you say clear expectations, I guess I'm thinking about our, our assignment rubrics uh, when we post an assignment. And I have to give you an example of this summer. I, I was experiencing a lot and I taught a class and I didn't, actually make my assignments it's my first time teaching it my assignments were not that clear because to be honest I didn't think deep enough about what I wanted my students to get from that and so I really appreciated Dr. Villanueva's um, presentation this morning where she talked about us giving the purpose of the assignment the the actual what we want them to learn from it the task involved and like what to do, what not to do, and then also the um, grading rubrics, how we're going to be grading to them so that they understand more about what we want. Um, because Mehmet, when you talk about having maybe a parent who is a single parent or a student who has a disability, do you want to have a different expectation for either of them? than for a person with the perfect life in your classroom? Uh, I guess, uh, I guess my uh, rubric will, will decide based on uh, what you said. Yeah. I need to do more on, on the rubrics, I guess. So do I, I have to tell you, uh, so do I. And, and I, I took a picture of that slide this morning because I'm like, in every assignment, I'm going to make sure that I've answered these questions really well. Um, you know, so. no problem. Because, you know, I, I just have to say that we want to have the same expectations for our, all of our students in terms of we want them to learn to the best of their ability. And you're right, students come in at all different levels. So that means that some of them may get a C, but really they learned more than anybody else in the class. And that's what we want. You know, the grades aren't the important thing. It's what students get out of our classes. And we want to maximize that. Anybody else? Vonda, this is Shelly. I have a question regarding expectations. Is there a yeah. difference or is there a time whenever it is okay? Is it okay to adapt for an individual student? If is it is it okay to go by on a case by case basis if you have a student that comes to you and there's been trauma in the moment, literally a death in the family or a, a severe illness, mono or appendicitis or something that's taking them out of the situation? Is it okay to make some adaptations for that individual? I mean, I, I'm hoping so because I have, but yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if that's an okay route I to go. All, I do all the time, you know, when mm -hmm. students, because, because. We also have ind individuals in our classes, right? And they're humans and things happen. And yeah, if I have students who, you know, I had a student whose husband had a heart attack last semester or was having heart issues. I shouldn't say a heart attack. Um, and she contacted me. She was really worried because she was, she couldn't finish an assignment. And I said, do you know what? Don't worry. You know, you can turn it in late. But when I graded that assignment, I had the same expectation of her. Okay, excellent. Because, All right. Yeah. We need to, things happen, right? Things happen with us. And we need self-compassion. We need to be humans with our students and 
empathize and really connect with them. And at the end of the day, so they can be successful in the field, we need to have high expectations as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh huh. It has been a wonderful session. Thank you, Vonda, so much. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna watch this again. I'm gonna look at all your slides again and, and revisit them because there's a lot of, of great information here that I wanna, I want to review. Um, just to remind everybody that, that the Mighty Networks app is there. Vonda can respond to some of your, you can interact and network with her through that app and um, reach out to her, I'm sure, other ways as well, right, Vonda? However, yes. they'd like to reach out to you. Yes, um, vonda.jump at usu.edu is my email, if anybody wants to. Excellent, excellent, thank you so much. It's been a great session and we encourage you to go back to the, the, the homepage and find for the next session and we will see you, we will see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. Bye, Vonda, you're awesome. Bye.